we go today to the uh, the transport layer uh, security. Uh, we will uh, look at, uh, say, uh, SSL TLS. I assume everyone has uh, heard about that term. Uh, we specifically look at uh, the protocol architecture, the handshake protocol, record protocol. I will explain the relationship between SSL and TLS a little bit later. Uh, then we will uh, spend some time on, on uh, certificates. They get more and more interesting. HTTPS, what is the relation between HTTPS and SSL TLS? Um, we have breaks somewhere here. I don't know exactly, probably. Yeah, we'll see. And after the break, at least, uh, we will continue with SSH. And there also there's a protocol architecture. But we inst here we have handshake protocol and a record protocol. With SSH, we have a transport protocol, user authentication protocol, and connection protocol. So uh, it uh, is uh, somewhat different. Let's start with uh, SSL TLS. SSL uh, stands for secure uh, socket layer, sockets layer. Um, it is um, basically something uh, that is already there for a long time. Um, when I uh, it uh, say basically started with Netscape around 1995. Uh, Netscape was at that time the the big internet browser. It disappeared. Uh, completely, but uh, it was the one who developed, say, the technology for the web. Um, what is it doing? It uh, provides privacy and data integrity. So what does it mean? Privacy means that if you send data over the web, it gets uh, encrypted. And data integrity means that you can verify the authenticity of, say, the remote part. This was used, say, uh, basically by Netscape for browsing the web, so it is uh, web technology, and it is used if you go to websites and you have to pay, which people started to do 20 years back, that you could be sure that uh, yeah, the payment went to the right person and no one could uh, change your payment. So um, that was, um, say, the history of it. Uh, there have been an, uh, a couple of versions, and basically uh, SSL went on till, uh, till version 3. Uh, originally, I say it's 1995, uh, it had limited strengths regarding encryption. Who has an idea who, how big the, the key size was around that time? 128 bits. Who has something else in mind? And you, well, you're right, you're right. So it's even lower. How low? 60. Ah, too difficult. 40. 40 bits. So what basically uh, happened is they um, uh, had for US uh, 128 bits and 40 bits for export. At that time, cryptography was still considered as, say, a weapon technology. And, you know, weapons buy, buying weapons in the U.S. is something that you can do at every corner. But exporting that to other countries uh, is something that was not allowed. So uh, at that time, we only had 40 bits, so the NSA could um, uh, easily break them. Now we have much bigger key sizes, so you see how much the NSA has advanced in this uh, 20 years. Isn't that a nice way of saying <laughs> something? Uh, okay, then uh, yeah, SSL was a, was a huge uh, uh, success, and then it moved to the Internet Engineering Task Force. That's the group who makes the Internet standards to make the transport layer security protocol of that. And basically, if you look at um, uh, what the IETF did, they, they started with SSL version 3. If you look at the, the coding in the packets, uh, you see the version number uh, SSL version 1 was 1, version 2 was 2, version 3 was 3, and uh, TLS went to 3.1, and then 3.2, etc. So um, you see that history even in, say, the version numbering. Um, the, uh, what I said already, it is the IETF who is standardizing it, but say SSL is still the name that most people no, but the protocol is basically TLS. Everyone who used still this software, SSL software, is completely outdated. Yeah, but, but still many people talk about SSL. 
uh, but it is TLS. Uh, there's not one version of TLS, there are multiple versions, and I see something is not on the screen here anymore. Uh, of course, it started with version 1.0, then we had 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3 is uh, something that is not standard, but it is an internet draft. So people are discussing, say, improvements here. Um, my feeling is that if you look at 1.3, I'm not a real expert in that, but they changed quite some things. Um, so um, here you see, I think from 1.0 to 1.1, there, there are really minor, minor improvements, making things more uh, clear. But 1.3 looks a bit, uh, say, uh, more differ different. Okay, so there are multiple versions. If you communicate with someone, it's important to know which version. Some versions uh, are, uh, say, um, not recommended. Um, okay, what is the goal of Transport Layer Security, TLS? Well, uh, you can find it in, say, the RFC of uh, TLS uh, 1.2. Uh, that is uh, RFC 5246, and they specify four main things. First, cryptographic security. Uh, what does it mean? It means that data gets encrypted. Now the question to you, do they do it with symmetric or with public key uh, encryption? Who has an idea? Symmetric? What do you think? Yes. So, like most protocols, they start with uh, public key, but that is, as I told last week, uh, computational, quite expensive. And so, they, uh, after they negotiated the first secure communication channel, they, they go to uh, symmetric keys because that's much faster. I'll come to that a little bit later. Uh, second goal is interoperability. That means that if uh, people make uh, different implementations, they should be um, able to work together so there are no implementation-specific things in the, in the RFC. Extensibility, that's primarily that you can easily add new encryption protocols or authentication protocols. So TLS gives you the framework and says, well, here's the field where you have to specify which encryption mechanism you use. Uh, but the details of that are defined elsewhere and you can easily change that. And the fourth thing is relative efficiency. Um, and that has to do with session caching. And let me now explain the way how TLS SSL is used. Uh, you use it to go to websites. For example, if you want to buy something or if you go to your bank, uh, you want a trusted connection. If you look at the original HTTP so, uh, version, then uh, you basically had to recreate a HTTP connection for every object that you were using. If you look at, say, current HTTP, then you can keep the connection open for a longer time. Um, if Initially, uh, for every object that you download, and who has an idea if you go to nu.nl, huh? uh, how many objects you will, you will get from there? To how many different servers do they point? So you say 30 to 40. Um, that was indeed the that was the case, say, a couple of years ago. We lately did analysis of how many DNS queries you do. So you start with with an empty DNS uh, uh, cache, and you go to new.nl and you s and you look at okay, how many different queries does it do? And it was, I, if I remember well, roughly 200. So far above 100, which is impressive. And so if for everything you you always have to uh, do this first public key uh, negotiation, create from that an, uh, an, a symmetric key. That takes a lot of time. So what do they do? They cache sessions. So if you have created already a trusted connection, uh, HTTP connection, with, uh, with the web server, and you stop and you 
go there again a little bit later, it will reuse the symmetric keys that you negotiated before. That really speeds up, say, your web experience. So that's why they do session caching. And that has to do with that they use the public key in the beginning and they move to symmetric key. And that's a costly uh, experience. Okay. Let's look at the protocol architecture. Um, there are multiple ways how you can draw this. Um, anyway, the key is you run it over usually uh, TCP, uh, transport, uh, or say the connectionless transport protocol. On top of that, you have the record protocol which takes care of confidentiality and message integrity. So encryption and the authentication part is, is here in the record protocol. But then you have a couple of protocols which people some, yeah, mostly uh, draw on top of that. That's the handshake protocol. That is the chain cipher spec protocol, although this will be removed, I understood, in version 1.3. Alert protocol and application protocol. The handshake protocol takes care of the initial creation of, say, symmetric keys. Chain cipher spec is at a certain moment you update your keys, alert if something goes wrong. Application protocol is, say, the web protocol or something like that. Yeah? Okay. Um, if you take Wireshark and you look at what do I see on the line, then you basically see in time the following. If this is your client and this is the web server to whom you uh, connect, the first step is there is a peer negotiation where you communicate with each other, hey, what kind of algorithms do you have? Uh, in the exercise for next week, which by the way I will publish on Friday, so you can't start yet, um, you will look at, say, servers and the uh, algorithm support that they have. Yeah. So that is the first step. Okay, after the negotiation, you basically uh, yeah, know what encryption and authentication um, mechanisms you will use, and then you uh, create your symmetric keys. Um, you do the authentication, where you often use uh, certificates uh, based on public key uh, stuff. Uh, and then the data uh, starts. So this is starting with public key, and then at the end you use a symmetric key. Let's look a li little bit deeper in, say, this, uh, this, this first protocol, the handshake protocol. Click. Um, how does it look like? Okay, the client first sends a message, the client hello message. So if you open Wireshark, that's what you see. And it has a couple of things. The SSL version, I already told you that if you look at SSL TLS, uh, numbering continues. Session ID. That's the thing that I explained earlier. If you do caching, uh, you have an ID which you can reuse later. Yeah? Then you have something random, uh, which is used for, say, initialization of your encryption algorithm. The encryption algorithms that you use, uh, so here you give a list. Uh, so you can say, I support. Uh, uh, DAS, triple DAS, AES, uh, blah, blah, blah. And you specify if you want to use compression or not. not. I think also in version 1.3 there's no compression anymore. Um, okay, the server basically says, okay, this is my version that I support, so you can down negotiate. Or here you say, uh, I uh, do this and this and this, and here you then at a certain moment decide, okay, let's do that. Session ID again. Another random, the ciphers that uh, yeah, you then agree upon and if you do compression. So that's relatively simple handshake. Um, after that, you have to start n yeah, verifying if the website is indeed a trusted website and uh, create your uh, new symmetric keys. So how does that work? Um, depends a bit on specific choices that you make. The, the red line interactions always happen. 
The blue one happen depending on the context and can also be integrated. So um, you can send a certificate and a server key. So if you use public key infrastructure X509, then you include here the certificate as well as the server key, but they are included in, say, one, one thing. Um, you can, but that's optional, and in most cases not done, uh, also ask from the server to the client, hey, client, I also want to see your certificate. Usually clients don't have it, but you can in a business environment, uh, you, you can use that. And then you end with this with the server hello done. Client sees this and basically sends then certificate back if that was requested. Uh, you have generated, say, the uh, keys and uh, at the end the certificate, uh, say, uh, verify. Uh, after here, you enter into, say, your data phase where you exchange encrypted data. And I'll come to that a little bit later. But first, um, what happens if you have a connection open for a long time or whatever? You can change your uh, cipher spe spec, so you can change your your keys. You can. I never tried it, but I think you should be able to to even change from triple dash to to AES. I guess. Um, so that's something that you can do during the data phase. But if you look at the, oh yeah, uh, so uh, ciphers. I want to say something about that. This is a uh, picture that uh, is was presented, and you don't see it here, but you see it on the slides that you can download uh, from the Internet Measurement Conference, where people uh, looked at what are the encryption algorithms and authentication algorithms. So the beginning is usually the encryption uh, encryption stuff and um, uh if you look at this, what do you think is interesting? You first. It still a lot of yeah, it still includes many old algorithms. Do you know some of them? Yeah, RC4, your you should not use that anymore. MD5 is still being used, but you better not do it. Yeah? Luckily, it does not include uh, uh, It does. I think there's a triple dash somewhere, but not yeah, normal dash. Yeah. Um, DHE is Diffie-Hellman uh, elliptical curve stuff. Um, RSA you have here. AES, you see key sizes, 128 and 256, they are roughly equal in, 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 in number. What is also interesting is that you hear see here RSA with, uh, how you an option is null. People still use that. That is intended for testing purposes, but it can be that people configured it wrong and that you can still get in well, RSA with, n with, with nothing. So uh, this is, say, a test that they did, in, I think, in 2011. And yeah, this, for example, is worrying that you see that people use R RC4, which is, uh, say, outdated. They measured at two places, and this is 25 to 30 percent. Not bad, or, or not good, sorry. Uh, this is a slide I just copied from uh, Wikipedia, but it gives you an overview of, say, which algorithms, encryption algorithms, you should use uh, in which version and which you should not use. Um, I'm not an expert in cryptography. It is something which I found find difficult. Uh, it's always slightly different than I expect. But uh, at least a couple of things that you can see. RSA is uh, still something that is uh, OK. Diffie-Hellman RSA, that's also OK. There are a couple of things which are not, uh, say, OK. That's this stuff, uh, of course. And Okay, well, something is off here, but it doesn't matter too much. So, uh, s this is the uh, authentication. Um, I was thinking about the uh, uh, encryption. So, uh, this is the uh, en encryption stuff that you have. RSA4 is, is, is mentioned here. You see it is 
already insecure since since the beginning and it's still insecure so you should never use it um, if you look here what is secure uh, some variants of uh, AES are se uh, secure Camellia that you uh, use for the last uh, exercise uh, uh, triple DAS ED uh, you shouldn't uh, use that anymore uh, DAS uh, CVC you shouldn't use that anymore so uh. So there are many choices and you can easily make the wrong choices and yeah, what we saw from this measurement that lots of websites still use outdated stuff. Okay, let's now move to the, the protocol to exchange, uh, say, data. How does it look like? This is your application data. So this is data that comes from your web application. The first step that uh, the TLS record protocol is uh, doing is uh, well, uh, since this m may be huge, um, you split it into blocks of a maximum of 16 kilobytes. So you fragment it. That has to do also with, say, efficiency of uh, uh, TCP, etc. So you split it. Then you may still compress it. There are some rules uh, how you, if, if you want that, uh, that you have to satisfy. There's only one uh, compression algorithm, deflate, that you can use. Okay. So now we have such fragments, presumably compressed. The first thing is at the end you add a, uh, say, a uh, message authentication protocol. Then uh, you encrypt the entire stuff. And then you add in front, say, a header here. Uh, so this is, uh, this is what happens for the second fragment. You do the same. For the third, you do the same, etc. Okay. Um, Certificates, I want to say something about that. Who is running a web server? Wow. Um, who is running a secure web server? <laughs> so who has gone? You hope so. Okay, yeah, that's the right answer. <laughs> the answer that you run a secure one is, uh, is wrong. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, but everything is breakable. But um, okay, so who ever went through the procedure of uh, trying to get a certificate? Good, so not too many. Um, okay, so what do you do? It's a few steps. First you create uh, yourself a certificate for your website. Then you ask the certificate authority to sign the certificate. And then the uh, you give the certificate uh, uh, to clients once they access your website. And we saw earlier in the, in, in the protocol where you include that. So let's dive a little bit uh, deeper in that. How do you do that? Uh, no, before I do that, um, this is another study, uh, also from IMC, where they looked at, uh, this was also 2011, where they analyzed the uh, validity of certificates that you see on the web. There are also tools for that. Um, and what you see is that, uh, say, uh, th th they measure the different places or they use different data sets. Um, OK is between 60 and 90 percent. Well, good. Or it's chain valid. Uh, you see expired certificates. It is still between, say, 20, 30, 10 percent. So many people have an expired uh, say a certificate. Um, Self-signed uh, certificate, that's still even more. Um, I must admit I also run something myself where I have just a self-signed certificate because I didn't want to spend the money of buying something. Um, okay, you may do this if you are sure. Yeah, there's a question. Yeah, there's another question because of the remarks. Yeah. Yeah. They could find a new way to print uh, properly signed certificates. Yes. Um, now you say that I remember that, so but I've never played with it. Who has played with it? It's not open yet. No. So yeah. It's in Q4 this year. Yeah. Yeah. Almost yeah. Yeah. Almost yeah. 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 Well, the other thing is that you can um, um, relatively easy, if you are from a university or whatever, via Terina get these uh, certificates. Uh, it's just also a web form. 
but um, my feeling, but I'm not 100% certain, is that the university should, should have a, a, a policy on that. And our university, like most universities, don't have such policy. So we're somehow able to get that. But, um, but, but that's also something you just click on it and you, and you have it. So. Um, yeah, but what you say is a is, is, is good point. I knew about that. I looked at it, but I never played with it. But I understand why. It is, it is important. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, that would get rid of the self-signed certificates. Um, what is uh, more worrying is a couple of things, uh, that the root certificate is uh, not in the root store, uh, or that there is no root certificate at all, or even incorrect other errors. So um, the landscape doesn't look too well, I would say. Good. How do you create one? Well, it's a piece of software that you run on, your, say, your machine, your Linux machine or whatever, where you generate uh, a, a certificate and you create by that the public and the private key. Of course, the private key should no ne never be shared. What should you do with, a, with such private key? Assume you you have a bank, what, uh, so this is something where security is important. Where should you store your private key? Yeah? In a hardware security lock. In a hardware yeah, security, what? So it's a bot that generates your key, and you cannot ever get your key out, but you can get a public key out. Okay, then, then you do it, say, and with... Then you can pump it to some thing or... But yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so you basically say you have sp specific equipment for that. Okay, then it should be secure. Um, what you should never do is uh, if you run your own computer that you store it on your own computer somewhere. Then it's better to put it on the USB stick and, and take the USB stick out and uh, put it in another place. Yeah. I yeah. know some uh, banks, they use uh, multiple split keys and that one person can't use one certain key, so you need to Mm -hmm. to com uh, combine and they yeah. all have a separate lock yeah. yeah. Um, you have, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you refer to that, but uh, forward secrecy, which basically means that um, assume somebody would capture all your data and at a certain moment they get into your machine or whatever and they're able to get your, your key. Uh, then uh, you should not be able with for forward secrecy to decrypt, uh, say, things that you have stored in the past. And that's something which gets more and more important nowadays. So, and therefore you also need multiple, say, keys or multiple secret uh, things. So if one thing gets broken... Yes, exactly. There is a, a free uh, certificate authority, it's called Star Capital, well. <laughs> you can explicitly click no, I will generate my private key, I will send you my PR and then they will uh, use the PR. Yeah, where is it hosted? China? <laughs> I don't know, I guess probably, yeah. I don't know. In, uh, NSA, maybe? NSA uh, complex. Uh, uh, yeah, perfect. Yeah. perfect, perfect. It's gr great. <laughs> okay, so um, you, you, you have this, then um, you uh, generate a certificate uh, blah 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 request, a signing request, yeah, uh, in which you have your public key readable uh, and uh, you sign it with your, using your private key for that. Okay, then you have something, then you have to submit it to a certificate authority, there are many certificate authorities, uh, they check the integrity of it, uh, they verify the, the website that you want to uh, authenticate. I come to that a little bit later, how they do that. And then they generate a certificate signed with their 
see Ace private key and they send the stuff to you and then basically you're ready after that to use it in the your communication. But uh, here you see here they, they verify something. How do they verify? Uh, there are multiple ways of doing that. And um, depending on where you read, you see slightly different terms there. Um, one is domain validated certificate. That's the easiest. It's called DVSSL. And the certificate authority uh, sends validation mail to the web master. So if you have access to the email of u20.nl, uh, uh, then you can get a certificate. Yeah. So it's not very strong, but it's relatively easy. And for many private people, this may be sufficient. For a bank, it's certainly not sufficient. So. Uh, the second is an organization validation certificate where they check more. They check if the organization really exists. So they go in the Netherlands to the Kamer van Koophandel or uh, they are check there if, if your company exists. But it still can be that you uh, ask there for, uh, yeah, although you're not entitled. So you can, uh, the University of Twente exists, but you're not the one who is supposed to ask the certificate for the University of Twente. So the third category is the extended validation certificate, where they really check if the one who requests this is authorized. What you can imagine is that this is cheap and this is really expensive. Um, and I'm not sure that the one that you said, huh, that is this open source initiative, what they exactly do, but I think that this is not likely. Well, yes, this requires human. And, and even this requires human, although you can automate it partially. But I think the first one, they, uh, they have some way to, uh, for example, add a human to enter the keyboard. So, so that this can signify to yeah. the QA that yeah. this is about to make this human. Yeah, you often see that, that they use DNS for, well, if you have access to the DNS server, then you're probably, yeah. yeah. How do you know if you're on a browser which kind of certificate you have? Because it's showing the log icon. Y yeah. So if there is a certificate, you see a log icon. By the way, I saw in the past a very nice. Uh, uh, you also know this favicon.icon yeah, yeah, yeah. for a website. People who had exactly that log thing there. <laughs> very confusing. You m most people may not notice it. So that's a good. Yeah, you have a. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, you can even <laughs> do that automatically. So, yeah. Um, like you just have to uh, have it on for the website as a default. Yeah. So, uh, every page will have that icon. So, this design itself doesn't say too much. The uh, other thing? Uh, like Chrome shows different kinds of colors. Yeah. So what color do you see with which certificate? I think with the first one, it uh, shows like the, the green bar. Yeah. Uh, and the other ones, it's, it's not. I don't know the difference between one Maybe and the other. Maybe the icon will like uh, amber color, which is always a bit weird. The problem is the extended vali uh, validation is, is usually green. But if you look at different, uh, say, browsers, then the domain validated is, is shown in different colors. So this is extremely confusing for people. Um, I assume I can't explain this to my sister. She will not understand that she will get lost. And so this is, this is a complex matter. Um, OK, so this is uh, basically the checking of the certificate. And so uh, once you got a certificate from the certification authority, you include it in your website. Every time someone connects with SSL uh, TLS, you send it to the client. Sorry, every time a client connects to you via SSL TLS, you send back your signed certificate. Um, and then here you have to check if the certificate is uh, authority is trusted. Um, how do you know if something is trusted? Yeah. If some um, trusted peer 
Yeah, but how do you know if so if a CA is trusted? Yeah, then you can manually check, yeah, you? Yeah, I'm not sure if it's the operating system, at least your browser. Okay. Uh, but who... Uh, but it depends on, so it depends on your browser and your operating system. Yeah. The operating system has to check the list. Yeah. It has to do yeah. automated communication with itself. Yeah. So I think maybe Chrome checks its own list and Firefox uses the system one as well. So yeah. I think Internet Explorer comes with the OS and... Sorry? The in Internet Explorer comes with the OS and the rest of them come with their own system. How many certificate authorities, trusted ones, are already pre-configured in your computer? Who has an idea? Eight, hundred, eighty. Yeah, it is more usually more than hundred. And so, if you look through that, I have absolutely no clue who I should trust. So, if there's someone who wants to um, do an attack later, just include a certificate authority, and then you are free to later manipulate whatever you want. 350. 350. Wow. But you have a Mac on which you run no, Linux. I, I connected to my Linux system. I don't know where oh. all my stuff okay. is. Okay. So basically, human beings can't know which certificate authorities you have to trust. Um, there are also a couple of other things. Um, you have um, uh, a certificate revocation list. So it can be that certificates uh, which are no longer valid, are revoked. I think one of the famous examples was at a certain moment someone had something for um, uh, uh, Microsoft, but um, what is probably the best example of um, wrong certificates? Diginota. Diginota. Who knows Digi Diginota? Who doesn't know Diginota? Oh, then I have to tell that story. Um, the Diginota was, uh, was a Dutch company. Uh, basically, um, I think it was created by a group of lawyers, so ran around 50 people, and there were at a certain moment also about five people who did, say, cybersecurity. And so they had a certificate, uh, uh, they, they uh, gave uh, certificates. They were in this list of uh, trusted uh, CAs. The problem was that um, at a certain moment, uh, their system was um, hacked, most likely by the Iranian uh, uh, security agents, agency, since um, people in uh, Iran, uh, they used uh, Google Mail, and the Iranian security agency was interested in what they were exchanging and everything was encrypted, so they wanted to read and so they needed keys or uh, whatever. So they... Um, the yes, yes. So the Arabian Spring was something where all these countries in the, say, Mediterranean, uh, southern part, uh, the uh, Middle East, they, the governments really were were afraid. Um, so you somehow can understand it. So they got into uh, Diginota and they, uh, they, they used Diginota to, um, to create a fake uh, Google uh, certificate. Google found that out a little bit later because they built it in some extra checks. But the problem was that all Dutch say important things of the government basically went via Diginota. And, um, uh, the one who was responsible for this uh, was a GovCert, um, I forgot his name. Um, but um, he once gave a very nice presentation where they discovered this on Monday morning. And I think it was Friday evening where at that time Minister uh, Donner uh, gave in the middle of the night, uh, uh, say a TV con press conference to say that we could no longer trust anything in the Netherlands. And he explains how the awareness of the impact of this, uh, how that grew in, in five days. And that's really shocking because uh, you basically can't trust everything you do with tax, export, whatever. How all your certificates may have been compromised. So that was an interesting thing. So DigiNota is say, a good example of how not to do something. Um, 
probably just as good as Dutch football was. So um, not a good. Uh, so uh, they basically didn't protect their servers, yeah. so you could. Uh, there, there were only a few people, um, and yeah, yeah. No. no, it is procedural audit, yeah. And um, what you see is the company was, say, 50 people were lawyers and five people were technicians. Yeah. The lawyers were all well paid, the technicians had something like, okay, you're there as well. And they complained already for a long time about outdated equipment or whatever, but... the. Maybe I should uh, have some nice uh, YouTube videos on that. I should put them on the website because it is just, just interesting to see what can go wrong. They are, by the way, not the only one who were compromised. There are a couple of others who, are comp who have been compromised as well. So, um, Finally, there's also something uh, which is called Online Certification Status Protocol, OCSP. That is what your system does regularly. Uh, it connects to see if the certificate is uh, valid. Um, after DigiNota, people suddenly started to rely on this uh, much more and it was interesting i have an uh, have, have an apple if you went to uh, the uh, wi-fi in the train then they also although they don't encrypt they do send a certificate or something like that and it was a kind of say um, deadlock because um, my system wanted to first check the certificate before i could go on the on the wi-fi but it couldn't check it because i wasn't on the wi-fi and so it, at that time you had to manually switch this off again, and, uh, which is not a good idea, of course. Good. Um, Heartbleed. Who has heard of Heartbleed? Who has not heard of Heartbleed? Good. Ah, at least for someone I can tell something. Heartbleed was, say, the big fun um, 2014, I guess, early 2014. Can't remember the exit. No, may. Hmm? Oh yeah, April, two, it is, yeah, disclosed in 2000. Sorry, uh, you're, you're reading my slides. That's not what you're supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> Joke, okay. So, um, um, it is, uh, say, a vulnerability in the OpenSSL stack. OpenSSL stack is uh, a stack that is used by nearly everyone in the world. Um, it is maintained by a handful of people. Uh, the I think there's one full employed and a few who uh, were part-time uh, deployed. They had just enough income to pay the heating and the rent for their equipment, but not enough to pay the people. But fortunately, their business model that they also give consultancy to companies how to use it, and in that way they made some money. But say the development of software wa uh, was, was something which was done on a completely voluntarily basis by a very small team of people, whereas the entire world relied on this infrastructure to be there. There's no government who is who's spending money on this open source stuff. Um, then the people made a mistake who implemented it, and I think the mistake was there uh, introduced already somewhere in 2012, two years earlier, um, one and a half to two years earlier. But it was, uh, say, found... Uh, April 2014, and basically what happened, and I stole, this is from Wikipedia, and I also stole this picture from Wikipedia because I think it's relatively clear. You have an attacker in the normal, and y there is in uh, TLS 1.1, one one? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly, where they introduced the heartbeat request, maybe it was even 1.2. It was something of as a kind of keep alive message. And so what you basically did is once in a while you sent a message, hey, are you still up? And um, if you're still up, uh, I sent you a, a few octets and send them back to me. And so you did send a packet which had blah, and you had 
the string that I sent you has a size of 4, if you did it well. However, the server did not check if this was indeed correct. So what did the server do? Um, just took this and copied what came uh, yeah, uh, from the start of the buffer, four characters. So if you would fill in not four, but 40,000, you just did send four, then in the server you reserved only, say, uh, you stored only blah, but then you requested from the beginning of blah 40,000 bytes. And the server did send it back, so it started with blah, and then you had a typical case of buffer overflow, blah, 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 blah. And somewhere in there you usually also had your, uh, say, your secret, uh, say, keys of your server. And in that way you could compromise everything that you wanted. Who has an idea how much um, repair of this um, hard bleed exploit uh, or uh, no, uh, it's not even an exploit. Uh, the heart uh, beat, heart beat uh, say vulnerability. How much financial damage that did, did cost? People did ma did make some calculations. Any clue? I uh, yeah, guess. Ten million. Ten million. Okay. Um, people made calculations based on s some data that was from the uh, one of the viruses in 2001 and um, compensated for a few things, etc. And they came to something like 500 million uh, dollar would not have been an unreasonable estimate that it did cost to repair this. So what do you see? Six people, one full-time, a few part-time, doing work, which is crucial for the entire internet uh, community. Um, no one wants to pay them. Yeah, why should you want to pay? Huh? You get it for free, but then the damage uh, at a certain moment is, uh, say, uh, 500 million. So um, after that, there are a couple of companies that understood that supporting this open source software that's crucial is uh, is something that they should do. So companies like Google, etc., they 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 do finance them a bit more. Yes, please. It's just SSL TLS. So you just sent, uh, you have an HTTP, uh, HTTP uh, hat, something to your, to, your, to your secure web, so 443, and uh, then you, you send something, and yeah, you, you have this special message, um, heartbeat, and you just code this field slightly different. No, it's port 443, it's the uh, encrypted, uh, HTTPS. yeah, HTTPS. So that's what they did. A um, couple of, uh, say, things that are interesting. People also tried to analyze, um, okay, who has been using this? And indeed, there have been a couple of uh, examples uh, before it became public, April 2014. Thank you. Um, and... Um, where people already tried to, to scan or uh, exploit it. The people found uh, things back that um, looked like an, the, the pattern that you would use for this heartbeat, uh, say, attack. And um, some people claim that the NSA was using this already for one and a half year. Um, that's not clear because also other things than the the heart bleed vulnerability or attack could, could lead to specific patterns. So, uh, so it's, it's not 100% clear if people exploit it, who exploit it, uh, et cetera. Um, which is also funny is, uh, of course, many researchers wanted to start scanning, and also in the Netherlands, the, uh, the certs uh, start scanning. And um, one of the things that they found that if you send such an attack on specific kind of um, say network uh, storage systems, I think even it was HP, but I'm not 100% sure about that anymore, that they would crash. So <laughs> that would that was, say, the perfect denial of service attack. You just send them one packet and the server crashes, which, yeah. good. 
Uh, so scanning was something where yeah, you should be careful. Okay, HTTPS, the, we already named the term a couple of times. What is it? It's also introduced by Netscape. It's just an application on top of SSL TLS. So it is just plain HTTP, which you run on top of SSL TLS. Nothing more than that, nothing specific. So just a layer in between. So it's uh, in an RFC, it's port 443, we just mentioned that one. And um, uh, yeah, what is important that you use that for client's web server. So a server should have a certificate uh, and clients may hold certificates. So HTTPS is nothing special. It's just the web, but then using TLS, SSL, 